It is written in the scriptures that we should journey to Jerusalem three times a year. We are going up to the city of God, to Jerusalem, to celebrate. The Lord told the children of Israel to honor seven holy celebrations each year involving three journeys to Jerusalem. Each festival would be uniquely fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah. The holy days of our Lord, shadows of things to come. Shalom and welcome to Zola Levitt Presents. I'm Miles, this is Catherine, and we are continuing in our series, The Holy Days of Our Lord. You know, Zola did a wonderful thing before he went to heaven. He made this series on all the feasts of the Lord and really gives us an idea of God's calendar. Last week we learned about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and what follows is the Feast of First Fruits, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Yeah, and I grew up celebrating Easter, and I had no idea that it was actually First fruits is what God calls it in his calendar, not Ishtar, after a pagan god. Yes, and so Zola is going to do a wonderful job of explaining to us how first fruits is actually Resurrection Sunday and leads to the birth of the church 50 days later. So let's join Zola on location as he tells us about the Feast of First Fruits. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you, and you reap the harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you have sown in the field. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and, and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord. Shalom, hello again. Well, why are we in a graveyard? Well, we're gonna talk about resurrection today. There's a feast, one of the seven, dedicated specifically to resurrection. Uh, behind me, you see uh, two of the Holy Land churches. That's the Mount of Olives. The, we're on the Mount of Olives, actually, the incline here. And the uh, church up uh, on this side is a Roman Catholic church where the Lord uh, traditionally wept over Jerusalem, said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And uh, on the other side to, to my right uh, with the golden uh, tops is the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. And there's a Roman Catholic below at the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, you know, Leviticus 23.10 tells us uh, about the festival of first fruits. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I'll give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he goes on to honor Sunday. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. And uh, this was a festival, obviously, they couldn't do out in the wilderness because you have to have the crops. Why did they go uh, down to Egypt? Well, the land was in famine when they left. Probably in the Exodus, they approached Moses and said, why are you taking us back there? According to my great, great, great grandfather or whatever, uh, nobody could live there. It was dry, the, the, the herds were dying, we couldn't plant, there was no rain. Uh, why are we going back to a land like that? Well, the land has been changed. That's why God says he wants a thank offering. He had changed the land. When they sent the spies in, uh, Joshua and Caleb at Kadesh Barnea, it took the two men to carry a bunch of grapes, this sort of thing. The land was really fertile. Uh, it had been changed. It was now a land of plenty. The three new holidays occurred during the counting from uh, first fruits over to uh, Pentecost. And you know, <laughs> this is a problem because the Christians count from first fruits, as Scripture says. Uh, when you come to the, the festival of Pentecost, it says in verse 15, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Well, it says from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Well, that's from first fruits. But the Jewish people count the thing from the second day after Passover because <laughs> At some point in their history, they got rid of this Feast of First Fruits. It was so obvious that this Sunday after the Passover represented the resurrection and that the Lord was raised on this day. 
my own theory is that in the first century there was so much powerful witnessing by Messianic Jews walking one way down the street on uh, First Fruit Sunday and the uh, unsaved Jews walking the other way and the Messianic said to them, well, that's foolish. You're still waving crops. Don't you know a man was resurrected and graves opened in Jerusalem? Uh, that's the point of the thing. Come with us. Hear what really happened. And uh, they probably did. And that's how people are. The, the rabbis must have sat down and said, there are too many converts, we've got to get rid of the feast. And they got rid of it. Problem, <laughs> the scripture says to count from first fruits and over to Pentecost. And when you get over to Pentecost, Sunday's honored again. You count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. So it starts, the counting starts on Sunday at First Fruits, it ends on Sunday at Pentecost. But when you throw out First Fruits and you pick a different starting point, it won't end on Sunday. Oh, one year and seven it might, but uh, so the Jewish, this is the answer to why the Christian Pentecost is always on a Sunday in May or early June, and the Jewish Pentecost is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, any day. Uh, they count from a different point. Well, I checked that out. I had the most interesting uh, discussion with an Orthodox friend here in Jerusalem. I wanted to look at the Hebrew Scriptures, and we got down a Hebrew-English Bible and checked out how, how they could uh, get out of this. In other words, how they could count uh, from a different day. And what had happened was in, uh, the English translations have been engineered. In verse 10, Sabbath is changed to day of rest. Well, now you can apply that to Passover, to unleavened bread, to the day after unleavened bread, it's a day of rest, and so on. Uh, that muddled that one. And in verse 15, uh, the morrow after the Sabbath, or the day after Sabbath, was changed to the day after the seventh week. So it allowed for, if you follow me, a wrong day. And all that happened, we looked at the Hebrew verses, they both say Shabbat in Hebrew, Sabbath. But they changed one to day of rest and one to the day after the seventh week. And in other words, they figured out a doctrine, they got rid of a feast, and then engineered the Torah itself. They changed the scripture uh, in the translation so that uh, English reading people could uh, be satisfied with the way they're doing it. They're not the only ones. Uh, the Christians changed uh, first fruits to Easter, and that's, uh, that's a mighty uh, strange one there. First Fruits is the name of this Sunday after Passover. Easter is the name of the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. I've taught this before in other contexts, but Ishtar was a goddess of fertility. That's different than resurrection. The Babylonians held fertility rites every spring. Uh, they put on new outfits because the trees were putting on new clothes. Uh, they, uh, they worship the things in nature that are fertile, the rabbit, uh, the eggs. Does any of this sound familiar? We have taken the Babylonian festival and uh, somehow amalgamated it with the resurrection day of the Lord. That's really a mistake. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, an egg hunt is an attempt at pregnancy. It's a fertility rite. We really shouldn't do that. We should celebrate the Lord's resurrection, but not fertility. Fertility is cheap. Uh, every living thing is fertile. It's a resurrection that you only get from Jesus Christ. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, In Adam all die, and Christ will all be made alive again. Yet each man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then we which are his when he comes. Well, if uh, his number in the resurrection was one, he's, he's the first fruits of them that God calls forth. Uh, he is the first man permanently resurrected. Well, then, if there's a one, then there's a two and a three and a four and so on. If there's a first fruit, there's a second, third, fourth, fifth. And indeed, those early numbers were taken by the people who came out of their graves when the Lord was resurrected in Jerusalem. Matthew 27 says at the time of his resurrection, graves opened <laughs> and people were walking about in the streets that, that people knew. What a shocking thing to see a relative come down the street you buried 10 years before and in perfect condition, uh, resurrected, obviously. Well, uh, if, if they have the low numbers, we have the higher numbers, and there's a number for everybody in this resurrection. We evidently proceed in ranks in the order we're saved, I presume. And uh, uh, this is a wonderful thing, because when you go into one of these busy stores and they give you a number, you know that you'll be served in your turn. And so that's how it is. It says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I think that should make everybody quite comfortable. You won't be forgotten in this resurrection. The gospel says, the hairs of your head are all numbered. 
It says the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, obviously, they have lower numbers. <laughs> now, uh, uh, these graves that opened up, what was that about? Well, it was first fruits, and uh, Jesus had resurrected in the morning, and he owed an offering. He always kept all the law. Well, the farmers who raised crops brought in the first fruits of their, uh, their earth and so forth to the temple to be waved. Jesus does not raise crops. Jesus raises people, so he must have raised a few as his offering on that first fruit Sunday. Hello, I'm Wayne Fournier, and I want to personally invite you to come with us on a tour of the Holy Land. With Azola Tour, you travel with Miles and Catherine Weiss. Plus, you have the added benefit of an Israeli tour guide who is a follower of Yeshua. Our founder, Zola Levitt, established this ministry in 1979. Today, we continue to bring you the truth of the gospel from a messianic perspective. Zola Levitt Ministries creates our weekly television program, Zola Levitt Presents, our website, levitt.com, and our free monthly news magazine, The Levitt Letter. All of this is accomplished with donations from viewers like you. If you believe this Bible teaching is worthy of your financial support, then please call us at 1-800-WONDERS. Visit us at levitt.com, or you can write to us at Zola, Box 12, 268, Dallas, Texas, 75225. We depend on your prayers and financial contributions. Thank you. Now let's go back to the program. Our location is near the famous Temple Mount in Jerusalem where the Tribulation Temple and the Great Millennial Temple will stand. And of course people are buried here because they want to be in the resurrection. It's a graveyard. We're talking about resurrection and these people are buried here because after all Zechariah 14.4 says his feet will stand that day upon the Mount of Olives which is next to Jerusalem on the east. That is where we are. The, this is just east of the temple and the Lord will come down to the top of this mountain to my left and come down this way. And these people want to be first at the resurrection and maybe they will be. Uh, you know, God created man on the sixth day and on the seventh day he rested. That's a, a basic Bible. But when we consider Jesus died uh, on the sixth day, Friday, and on the seventh day he rested too, uh, Saturday, but he rose on Sunday the eighth day, the first day of a new kind of creation. Adam brought us death. I mean, after the days of creation, he started off, he sinned and brought death into the world. But Jesus brought resurrection, the cure for death. We now have a different kind of uh, spiritual society, one in which we can survive by resurrection and do not have to be permanently separated from God, which is uh, the biblical uh, definition of death. Uh, or at least the second death. So, uh, you know, Israel as the first fruits was planned to be resurrected and all those who will believe in Israel and be adopted and believe in the Jewish Messiah. Uh, Jeremiah 2, 3 says very simply, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. Uh, farmers increase his crops. Uh, the Lord's increase his souls, uh, uh, resurrected lives. And Israel is the type of that, the beginning of that. The chosenness of Israel goes on through the church. The harvest uh, had really begun. As a practical matter, uh, the first fruits uh, remind us of the fruits of the Spirit. Or as Christ said, uh, you'll know my disciples by their fruits. Uh, the, the believers have good fruits. And they are described in Galatians uh, 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit which accompany the believers. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such 
There is no law, <laughs> indeed. Uh, we are, all have gifts of these uh, uh, ways of living uh, when we come to the Lord. We just need to uh, use them to be in touch with Him. You know, none of the harvest could be touched until the first fruits were offered. And the kingdom really can't start until all souls, all the, all the rest of the resurrection is called in. Uh, the rapture of the church will be one addition to the kingdom. Well, the originals, of course, the Old Testament saints, which God in his forbearance uh, will save in the end, uh, uh, Romans uh, 3.25, because their sacrifices were made, they demonstrated their faith, and when Messiah comes, he looks at their accounts, sees them fulfilled, and they are saved. Then comes the church, the, the believers from Pentecost to the rapture, uh, they, of course, uh, go to heaven translated like Enoch and Elijah, and uh, they too will go to the kingdom. But then there's the sheep from the tribulation period. Even just a seven-year period, God is so careful. Scripture says he does not suffer any to perish, and uh, he will examine the whole world as to whether they were sheep or goats in the tribulation. And, of course, the test question is Matthew 25, 40. And as much as you've done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. How did you treat Jesus' brothers most intensively, the 144,000 who are witnessing, the 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, in the, uh, in the end, those two will be resurrected and added to uh, the ones I mentioned. And finally, all the first fruits are in, and the grand harvest uh, uh, of the kingdom can be enjoyed. And then a thousand years of bliss, and then on to eternity. Wonderful teaching from Zola on first fruits. You know, in order to better understand the, all of the feasts at the time of Jesus, our producer Ken Berg had a chance to interview the editor of Eretz magazine in Israel. So let's go to that interview right now. In order to understand Judaism in the time of Jesus, in the first century, you have to cut through this veil. You have to cut through this veil of rabbinic Judaism and try to understand what happened before. It's not easy. It's like you're groping in the dark. You know, you're, you're touching little things. Who's like the only, remember, the only two Jewish sects that survived the rebellion. And, and the Talmud says there were 120 Jewish sects during the time that the temple was in existence. The only two that survived were Christianity and Judaism. The only two, rabbinic Judaism and Christianity after the temple, were the only two Jewish sects that survived the rebellion, where are the Ebionites, and where are the Pharisees, and where are the Sadducites, and where are the people of Qumran, and the Essenes, okay, they're gone, but they were there, okay, and, and they made up Judaism, and, and Judaism was a very lively and very um, fervorful kind of religion, and that's gone, and in order to understand that, we have to like grope through this veil in order to get there. We're doing a series on the uh, Feast of Israel, mentioned in Leviticus 23. So you're saying that the first Christians, the Jewish Christians, would have practiced uh, going up to Jerusalem three times a year. The feasts, more than anything else, were, were the, I think, a portrayal of the most important thing of Judaism was the community, the feeling of community, the feeling that you belong to a group that does things together, which, by the way, was missing from the Roman world, and I think is also missing for many people today. Their feeling of community, who do I belong to? I don't only belong to a nation, okay? A nation is too amorphous. Who's, I want to belong to, to, to a group, to neighbors, to friends, okay? And, and this is the first century, and, and uh, if you don't understand this, you're, you're losing this whole idea of the feasts and the festivals, which, which wasn't something that was done at home with your family. It was something that was done in your community. And this togetherness is, is what made uh, Judaism what it was later as it developed and what made it so attractive to everybody else who wanted to be part of this. Okay, they want to be part of this big community. Can you pinpoint a time and a person responsible for the separation of uh, Christianity and, and Judaism? Christianity was developing in two ways. There was Jewish Christianity, okay, the Christians who were Jews, and then it was Gentile Christianity. Gentle of Christi the Gentile Christianity were these Gentiles who wanted to be Jews. Okay? They were called God-fearers, okay? like Cornelius from Caesarea. 
They were called God-fearers. They liked the idea of community of Judaism. They liked the idea of a Messiah. They liked the idea of one God who was unseen. Okay, you remember the God of the Roman Empire was the emperor. And the emperor happened to be a little small midget who just married his horse. Okay, I say, well, this is God. <laughs> you know, there's a big problem with that. So this idea of, of Judaism worked very well for them, and it made sense. They didn't like the, the everyday little nitpicking of what it was all about. Christianity allowed them, Peter and especially Paul, allowed them to join this idea of group, this idea of togetherness, this idea of a Messiah without the rigmarole. And they joined in thousands. And suddenly you had the Jewish Jews, the Christian Jews in the same synagogue, and next to them the Gentile Christians. And they were all together, the same community, same region. But the Gentiles, the Gentile Christians grew rapidly. And in many places, like Antioch, Alexandria, suddenly there were more Gentile Christians than there were Jews. And, and then there were Jewish Christians. Okay? And they became the bigger community. And they were full of this messianic fervor and so on. And Judaism was beginning to have a problem. They were saying, the rabbis were saying, if we allow this into Judaism, because they were all Jewish, remember, if we allow this into Judaism, if we allow this Christian thing to go on with the Gentiles, we're going to lose the Jewish identity that we are trying to keep. And this heated argument reaches the year 140, where Rabban, Rabbi Gamliel II, who was the president of the academy, says, from now on, if you're Christian, you're not Jewish. You have to make a decision. Are you Jewish or are you Christian? The Gentiles are out. The, Jew, the, the Jewish Christians slowly petted out because they couldn't do it anymore. And the church that survived was the Gentile church, which was rejected. They went through the beginning with the rejection. They had another problem. The minute the Jews said the Christians were not Jewish, the Christians suddenly didn't have a religion, didn't have what was called in the Roman world a legal religion. It was illegal not to have a religion. Christianity was not a religion. Judaism was. And as long as you were Jewish, even as a Christian, you had the legal religion. But now you're not. And we have letters of various Roman administrators saying, what to do with these Christians? You know, do we persecute them or not? It's a very famous answer of the Emperor Claudius who says, if you find them, persecute them, but don't look for them. Okay? Don't make an issue out of it. It's sad, it's unfortunate, but many Christians aren't familiar with, with their Jewish roots. When I wrote the article, I used the text of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount has nothing in it that couldn't be read today in a synagogue. Okay, you could take the Sermon on the Mount and read it in a synagogue and all the Jews would say Amen. Okay, because the basic, the basis is there, okay? And we believe in that the same as everybody else. And, and that's why I use that, blessed are the peacemakers. Everybody said, yes, okay. I said, you know what? Blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are the poor and this and that. You know where that comes from? That comes from the New Testament. Ah, horror! <laughs> you know? okay. But people can accept that. People can accept that, okay? It won't happen overnight. But it is happening. And understanding that there is a, a common base of Judaism and Christianity, and that when I look at Jesus and when a, a Christian looks at Jesus, we, we, I don't have to accept that Jesus is the Messiah. But I can accept, and this is what makes the difference between me and, and the Christian. The Christian says Jesus is the Messiah, he died, and he uh, was resurrected after three days. I say, I don't accept that. Okay? But I do accept that the teachings of Jesus, okay, the fact that there is uh, something more than everyday life, okay, the fact that there is a redemption, the fact that uh, we have to live, live our lives in a certain spiritual way, that's acceptable. And most Jews can accept that. There was a, um, a poll taken in Israel after the visit of the Pope that 75% of uh, Israelis would like to know more about Christianity. Something new. They feel they don't know, and they feel they would like to know more, which is interesting. 
okay, which shows that actually on, on the people to people level, there's a beginning of understanding that, that we have more common roots than we have things that, than we have differences. That Zola in Israel playing the music that he plays so well and teaching us about first fruits. First fruits is really resurrection. It's really about life from the dead. And it's not about Ishtar or the pagan holiday that we've come to know, but it's about first fruits, the resurrection of life. It really is on the Hebrew calendar. It's God's timing, it's God's feasts. And Zola does a great job of explaining to us about resurrection life, about first fruits. You know, Jesus was sinless and holy. And so when he paid the price for your sin and for mine, when he rose from the dead and went to heaven, the graves opened in Jerusalem. It's an incredible story, but true. And we can follow him to heaven if we know him, if you know him, as I do, as Catherine does. We want to implore that you would get to know Yeshua, get to know him. One way to know him, of course, is through his word. And we, we would love to help you. Our offer this week is Discovering Our Jewish Roots. This is a nine CD set and it will teach you about the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith, teach you about the feast. It's an amazing study that will help you understand everything that you're seeing in this series and beyond. So we want to offer that to you this week. And until we see you again, we want to remind you, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, Discovering Our Jewish Roots, a one-of-a-kind study with nine CDs and workbook that begins with a survey of Old Testament messianic prophecies. This simple and direct lesson plan covers a vast range of topics, including Gentile salvation, the Abrahamic covenant, replacement theology, and Messiah in the Passover. Packaged in a handsome custom album with a matching 21-page study booklet, don't miss your opportunity to enhance your understanding of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. Also, please call toll-free or write to receive our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. It's absolutely free and contains insightful article and news commentary with a refreshing perspective you won't get from the mainstream media. The Levitt Letter is also available at levitt.com along with current and archived TV programs, our national airing schedule, and much more. Please remember Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.